Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of ATP, Ask the Pastor. I am Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. If you're in the Texas Hill Country, stop by and see us on a Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Divine Service. Dear Pastor, I'm a fellow Lutheran right now in the AFLC, and I'm having a debate with my pastor about how loose he does communion. He calls it closed, but he only requires people to be believers and to be seeking forgiveness. I've been trying to impress upon him the importance of the communicant's belief in the real presence of Christ by using 1 Corinthians 11.29. I was also hoping to use the Lutheran Confessions. I looked last night, but I couldn't really pinpoint anything. Could you direct me to where the practice of closed communion is mentioned in the Lutheran Confessions? Sure. Uh, But first, I want to say, if your pastor doesn't require communicants at his altar to believe that Christ is truly present in the sacrament, I have to wonder if he himself believes this. Uh, Now, I don't say that to be mean, but I say that because the bodily presence of Christ in the sacrament is the primary scriptural reason for the practice of closed communion. St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 27, Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So eating and drinking unworthily doesn't make you guilty of a symbol of Christ's body and blood, nor does it make you guilty of some far distant spiritual body, as if there could be such thing as a spiritual body. But rather, he says, eating and drinking unworthily makes you guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, in verse 29, which you mentioned, uh, he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So the Lord's body, which is being discerned here, of course, is not the church as the body of Christ, but the true body and blood of Christ, with our, which are present in, with, and under the bread and wine. Uh, if Christ's true body and blood are present, and the pastor allows any penitent sinner to come, regardless of their beliefs about Christ's true body and blood, uh, he is potentially allowing all sorts of folks to eat and drink judgment upon themselves, inviting people to become guilty of the body and blood of Christ. That's not loving, and that's not pastoral. You know, you're actually allowing people to drink judgment upon themselves. Uh, you know, and so from this, I can only surmise that either this pastor himself doesn't believe that Christ is truly present, or he doesn't take the office of the ministry as seriously as he ought. Now, that being said, as to your question, uh, the practice of closed communion is alluded to twice in the Lutheran Confessions. The first is Article 24 of the Augsburg Confession, paragraphs 34 through 36. And in this section, Melanchthon is arguing against private masses uh, for the living or for the dead and stating that Lutherans hold to one communion every holy day and on other appropriate days. He then adds, and this custom is not new in the church, for the fathers before Gregory make no mention of any private mass, but of the common mass, that is the communion, they speak very much. Chrysostom says that the priest stands daily at the altar, inviting some to the communion and keeping back others. Now, Melanchthon uses the example of Chrysostom here to demonstrate uh, the point that even the daily masses back in the early church were public, not private. However, for our purposes, the phrase that's important is inviting some to the communion and keeping back others. This is closed communion because the altar isn't just open to anyone, nor is it open to those who profess to be Christians, but it's only open to certain Christians. So then that leads to the question, which Christians would have been allowed at the altar in the early church? Well, Justin Martyr writes in the 66th chapter of his first apology these words, And this food is called among us Eucharista, which, uh, of which no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true, and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins and unto regeneration, and who is so living as Christ has enjoined. So according to Justin, there are three requirements for admission to the Lord's table. The first is unity and belief, uh, that the communicant believes the things which we teach are true. By this, Justin means more than simply the doctrine of the real presence, uh, although that's certainly included in the all things, uh, but he means the entire Christian faith. So the first requirement to commune at the altar is agreement in the doctrine taught at that altar. The second is baptism. And note that that's a really early um, uh, 
attestation to uh, baptismal regeneration. And then the third is the Christian life, meaning that the communicant isn't living in manifest public outward sins. Now, Justin's writing around 150 AD or slightly before in Rome, the center of Christianity in the second century. So that's a very early attestation, not only to baptismal regeneration, but also then to the practice of closed communion. The practice actually goes back further into scripture. Uh, We see this at Pentecost in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, uh, where they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of the bread and in prayers. So unity in the apostles' doctrine was integral for worship and receiving the Lord's Supper then. Now, the Lutheran confessions also address the question of who is an appropriate communicant. And this is the second place in the confessions um, where this practice of closed communion is mentioned. And that is the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 24, first paragraph. It states, For among us, Masses are celebrated every Lord's Day and on other festivals in which the sacrament is offered to those who wish to use it, after they have been examined and absolved. So why are communicants first to be examined and absolved? Well, they're to be examined to make sure that they hold the Christian doctrine, the apostolic faith. They're also then absolved of their sins, which means they've been to confession, so they understand that the Lord's Supper is for the forgiveness of sins and for the strengthening of their God-given faith. So if the pastor hasn't examined the potential communicants, then he's got no business commuting them. Now, what about visitors from another Lutheran congregation? Well, this is where the doctrine of fellowship comes in. Are they in fellowship with your pastor and parish? Uh, Is there doctrinal agreement between their pastor and yours? In our day, that's expressed in church fellowship. So uh, do the visitors belong to a congregation that's part of your pastor's doctrinal fellowship? If not, then they have no business communing there in the first place. Not because they don't believe in Christ's real presence, but because they're not united with your congregation and your pastor in the apostles' doctrine. Church membership is, as we've said before, a public confession of one's faith. And it's just as important as the verbal confession of one's private beliefs that we make with the mouth. And this too, then, is expressed in the early church. So book seven of the Apostolic Constitution, specifically Book 7, Chapter 12, Paragraph 2, says this, The deacon shall immediately say, Let none of the catechumens, let none of the hearers, let none of the unbelievers, let none of the heterodox stay here. So the heterodox would be those Christians of different confessions who were not in communion with the local bishop and therefore were not in communion with that congregation. So there's another example even in the early church of closed communion, where not everyone who confesses to be a Christian should automatically be communed. Now, all this can be summarized like this. Closed communion simply prevents people from, uh, people who don't believe in Christ's words, uh, from eating and drinking judgment upon themselves. And that's what makes closed communion a loving practice. Closed communion also then confesses that unity in the apostles' doctrine is the Lord's will for his people and a prerequisite then for unity at the Lord's table. Uh, So that's where closed communion comes in in the Lutheran Confessions and a couple times in church history. Now, I want to give you two words of caution, if I may, as you deal with your pastor. The first is that as a pastor of the AFLC, he may not be swayed by the examined and absolved line from the apology. And the reason for that is because officially the AFLC only accepts the ecumenical creeds, um, Luther's small catechism, and the Augsburg Confession as a true exposition of faith, and life. That's from their website. Uh, So the apology may not be authoritative for him, although I can't imagine it not being, since it's a defense of the Augsburg Confession, which he uh, is supposed to be confessing. The second word of caution is this. Uh, If your pastor isn't moved to practice closed communion based on the words of St. Paul, and out of love for his communicants and for his sheep uh, there that he has uh, been given charge over, uh, then I doubt the Lutheran confessions are going to sway him either. Now, I pray that I'm wrong and that your conversations with him are fruitful, but if they aren't, then it's time for you to start looking for another parish that has a faithful pastor. And something to consider that is, if this practice is tolerated in the AFLC, then you're going to want to find a church and a pastor that aren't in that fellowship as well. Thanks for the question. Best of luck to you in your conversation. We'll see you next time on ATP.